Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, second of this year's Reich Hour Lectures, uh, sponsored by the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies and co-sponsored by the Asia Center, the Korea Institute, and the Reich Hour Institute for Japanese Studies. Um, I'm so pleased that many of you have joined us for uh, a second day. Um, there is, of course, a third lecture uh, coming up tomorrow, the same time in the same place. Um, I will be very quick in my introductions today um, for the sake of those of you who are attending all three uh, lectures. You probably only need to hear Professor Westad's biography once. Um, so I apologize in advance. This will be a, a brief and, and somewhat informal uh, introduction. Um, our Reichauer lecturer for this year, for 2017, uh, is Arna Westad. S.T. Lee Professor of U.S.-Asia Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, where he has taught for the last couple of years since joining us uh, from the London School of Economics. Uh, he's uh, uh, a very distinguished uh, scholar of East Asia, both in the longer, the long durée of history, but especially, he's especially known for his work on the 20th century, his book, the Global Cold War, Third World Interventions, and the Making of Our Times was the recipient of the Bancroft Prize. Restless Empire, China and the World Since 1750 won the Asia Society Book Prize, uh, Book Award for 2013. And his new book, um, which uh, I am very much looking forward to so I can assign it in class next year, uh, The Cold War, A World History, will be out uh, later this year. Um, he, uh, uh, I'll just mention one thing about these lectures, which is that he, uh, to me, it's a wonderful comment on both the regard uh, which Professor West that is held in the scholarly community, but also in the uh, increasing interaction between scholars here at Harvard uh, and our colleagues in Asia. Uh, it, it, with that in mind, I will mention that uh, after delivering this version of the lectures, he will go on the road and deliver. Uh, another version of these lectures uh, at the International Liaison Department of the Communist Party of China in Beijing. Uh, and it would be, it would be, it'll be very interesting to compare uh, the, two, the two sets of lectures. Our discussant today is uh, Ezra Vogel, uh, Henry Ford, the second professor of the Social Sciences Emeritus here at Harvard. Uh, Ezra, I'm going to be brief in my biography you but for a different reason, which is that I think you're so well known to the community that I don't need to, uh, to uh, uh, go on at too much length, but just a few quick words on Ezra's background. He was professor at Harvard uh, from 1967 until his retirement in 2000. Uh, during that time, among his other uh, services to the community and his accomplishments, he was the second director of the Harvard, of Harvard's East Asia Research Center from 1972 to 1977, following, of course, the founder of the center, John King Fairbank. He was director of the Fairbank Center uh, after it was renamed uh, from 1995 to 1999, and also the founding director of Harvard's Asia Center. Uh, he's the author, as many of you know, of, of many books. I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, Japan is number one, Lessons for America, was for a long time, the, sorry, the Japanese translation of Japan as number one was for a long time uh, the all-time bestseller in uh, Japan for nonfiction by a Western author. Um, his, uh, his most recent book, I suspect, will probably attain that same accolade in China. I'm speaking, of course, of Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China, published in English in 2011. and. Um, uh, has, uh, was a bestseller here and then an enormous bestseller uh, in China. I'll just mention one other of his books, um, which is uh, for The Four Little Dragons, The Spread of Industrialization in East Asia. I choose this among the many other books I could choose because it is the uh, revised version of his Reichauer lectures uh, delivered uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, so, in following the format yesterday, uh, Professor Westad will deliver his remarks, uh, Professor Vogel some comments, and then we'll open things up to the floor. Uh, just for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll take two minutes or three minutes to talk a little bit about uh, what we were treated to yesterday. Uh, Professor Westad began with uh, what, to my mind, was a very unexpected uh, terminological or even linguistic 
uh, uh, and historical exploration of the key terms of his title. Uh, few would argue with the characterization of either Ming or Qing as an empire. Um, the argument that Korea was a kind of nation avant la lettre, perhaps a more um, um, controversial argument. Um, uh, perhaps the most surprising part of the terminological exploration was the argument that the uh, pursuit of the third term in his title, righteous or righteousness or rectitude, was a long-term uh, trait in Choson foreign policy, uh, for policy making in general, but specifically foreign policy. Um, and I don't know if I'm being fair to your account, but I will say the pursuit of righteousness was a long-term Choson foreign policy objective, even in the face of Qing revisionism. Um, it was part of a larger Choson attempt to transform society, to transform the values of the Korean people, to imprint them on them uh, a specific ideology, and to build a state of high capacity. Uh, I hope I'm not giving away uh, the secret of tomorrow's lecture uh, when I say that the parallels with uh, one of the Koreas today are remarkable. The formal relationship between the empire and the righteous nation was encompassed by something, Western, by something that Western historians would later term the tribute system. Uh, and Professor Westad said that the tribute system uh, was a bit of a misnomer, something that's probably known to us all. Uh, it was more of a system, as he put it, at Harvard than it ever was a system in practice in East Asia. I think, though, actually, Fairbank uh, would have, with whom the, the notion of the tribute system is so closely associated, would actually have appreciated uh, the way you drew attention to the flexibilities within the system. Uh, it was actually a system that encompassed different uh, perspectives, that allowed different people to put forward their own perspectives, uh, or different actors to put forward um, different perspectives. Um, a couple of the images that really struck me from your account of these flexibilities, the Qing state welcoming envoys from Chozon uh, to, to deliver tribute, um, but also trying to inoculate the Chinese population from dangerous ideas emanating from Korea. And the Chozon uh, diplomats, for their part, participating in the rituals of the tribute system, while subtly, and sometimes not so subtly indicating um, their doubts about the very legitimacy of the emperor to whom they were kowtowing. So the message I take from that is that this was clearly a hierarchical relationship, as Fairbank would have argued. But hierarchical it may have been, Choson was not a tool that the Qing controlled at a time when China's capacity to shape the behavior of one of the Koreas is a hugely pressing question for US foreign policy, and therefore actually for global security, understanding the historical relationship between these two polities is, of course, a very timely question. Uh, movie aficionados will know that in any trilogy, part two is the tricky part. Um, Luckily for Professor Westad, uh, the period that he's going to cover today is a period of high drama, tremendous transformation. We look forward to, I look forward to hearing about the Empire and Righteous Nation, part two. Please join me in welcoming Professor Westad. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, as they say, it's good to be back. And uh, it's wonderful to be here in uh, the company of uh, Ezra Vogel. Professor Vogel is one of the East Asianists. The term really makes sense for him and perhaps for him only because he covers so much ground with regard to East Asia, uh, who I most admire. And his work has always been an inspiration for me in terms of how I want to do history and social science with regard to the region. First and foremost, that I want to do it as a region. Right? I don't want just to look at one of the countries. I want to look at the relationships among them. And Ezra has been the inspirator for a lot of people who want to think about 
East Asia in those terms, but also because of the breadth of his knowledge and the way that he applies it in many different ways in terms of the works that he has, uh, he has done in the past and, and what, he, what he is doing uh, at present. So uh, having um, Ezra Vogel as my respondent today is a true honor, and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply honored, Ezra, that you could find the time to do this. Now, yesterday, um, we went on a light gallop through 500 years of Sino-Korean relations. And today it's going to be a little bit more focused. Um, maybe not all that much, because I'm still covering a great deal of ground in, in chronological terms. Um, roughly from the mid 19th century and up to the end of the 20th century. So as I said yesterday, tomorrow's lecture is going to fo focus almost exclusively on the contemporary relationship uh, between China and, and Korea and the two, the two Korean states. So we have quite a bit of ground to cover today as well. And some of this, as, as Professor Zoni um, indicated, is complicated. It certainly is dramatic, but it's also very complicated because what I tried to do yesterday was to give an impression of a world in which there were some sharp breaks, such as the Great East Asian Wars of the late 16th and early 17th century, uh, or the advent of the Joseon and the, and the Ming in the, in the 14th century. But mostly, structures were put in place that seemed to last in some kind of form that was integrated for a fairly long period of time. Today is all about change. This lecture is about the tremendous changes that this whole region went through in the late 19th and, and in the, the 20th century. So by the early 19th century, this East Asian world that I was talking about yesterday starts to transform itself in interlinked processes, some of which take a great deal of time to play themselves out, some of which are with us today, but some happen and are fulfilled very quickly. And that's the change, really, that we need to look for <coughs> in terms of the 19th and early 20th century. It is about foreign incursions. It's about powers that up to then had been uh, bit players in terms of the East Asian world, European and North American powers, taking center stage in much of, what is, much of what is happening. But it's also perhaps more importantly and more significantly for understanding this region today, a complete recalibration of the relationship between the various countries and states in East Asia. So what is happening in the 19th century, I would venture, and this is the point that I put forward in the book I published a couple of years ago, Restless Empire, what is happening happens both from within and without. And you can't understand these changes in regional terms without, without looking at both. Because this is not just about foreign incursions, of course, as historians who dealt with this recently have, have told us. It is also about happens, what happens from within. And at the core of it, at least to me, maybe this is my in terms of my background and my training, the overall sinocentrism that I carry somewhere deep inside of me. But, but even so, I think it is correct. At the, at the core of it stands a Qing strategic and political crisis that starts in the very last part of the 18th century and then continues into the 19th century. It is not, I mean, just to make that clear to begin with, it is not a unilinear kind of development. Decli it's not just a decline and fall story, and I'll, I'll get to that later on. There are many ups and downs in the history of the Qing in terms of its international affairs in the 19th century, uh, especially as Korea is concerned, as Kirk Larson pointed out yesterday. But at the beginning of the century, just at the same time as the outside um, incursions into Eastern Asia start to be felt uh, in earnest, there is at the same time a domestic and internal crisis within the Qing Empire. 
Now, I won't spend time today discussing the reasons for this crisis. Uh, historians approach this, as many of you will know, from very different angles. There are some who basically see it as structural. They emphasize overpopulation. They emphasize limited resources. They emphasize a decline in productivity and innovation, at least over what had been the case 100 years before. And all of that may very well be true. But in my view, having looked quite closely at that particular period, sort of from 1800 and up to, and up to uh, 1850 or thereabouts, this is not enough in itself to challenge the Qing state. So in my view, um, if it hadn't been for what happened within the empire, uh, what happened politically within the empire, uh, I think the chances uh, were fairly significant that China would remain for much of the century to follow um, a bit like what it was around 1800, still one of the richest and most productive places on earth. The problem was, in terms of political decisions that had been made, it was lost wars, unnecessary lost wars, in places like Vietnam and Burma, it was decline in public finances, mainly because of the organization, not because that the tax base itself changed, but the capability, the capacity of the Qing state to actually gather these taxes, that, that changed for political reasons. And it was a very significant lack of leadership. And what this led to was that the role of the state, and you heard about this yesterday, and many of you will know about it from before. The role of the Qing state, which was so significant in stimulating the economy within the empire. This was an empire that put the functions of the state at the center of its economic dynamism. This role of the state started to recede, started, started to change. Rudderlessness, uncertainty, decisions postponed, this is the Qing Empire in the very early part of the 19th century, well before any major issue of opium, opium consumption and opium import had taken the first stage um, in, in China. Lack of leadership at the central level, uh, monarchs, emperors who were different from their great forebears, who had been able to think strategically about a lot of things that their successors in the early 19th century did not do. But also a lack of will to reform. I mean, a kind of stasis within the state uh, that became very pronounced when you get to the 1830s and, and 1840s. Now, Korea in the early 19th century, and you heard part of, of this yesterday, is a different form of state from what we have within the Qing. It is much more agricultural. I mean, Qing China was an agricultural state, but it also had significant urban centers. Uh, Korea had very few of this. It was mainly a rural uh, country. But within this agricultural setting, there was, a, as Michael pointed out in his excellent summary of yesterday's talk, there was a state with a great deal of capacity to get what it wanted to do done. And part of that strength was ideological, as I argued in the lecture yesterday. But parts of it also had to do with capacity, with actually getting the kind of resources that were necessary for the upholding of this image of the state that the neo-Confucian ideology pushed with regard to Joseon uh, and the format that it took um, as, a, as a state, as a, as a government. What this did do, undoubtedly, was that it increased the burden on the peasantry. Not to a point where uh, the state would have been threatened by rebellions from within, though there were significant rebellions um, in, the, in, in the 19th century, but in a way that questions some of the most cherished ideas of the Joseon state about its representativeness for everyone uh, within, the, uh, within the country. So there were difficulties in, in Korea or in Joseon as well, but they were of a slightly different character than what you found in, in Qing China. So it is in a way the change on the Chinese side, which is most important to me in terms of understanding 
how these broader processes of change then uh, take place and how they and how they develop. And that, as I already said, is the coming together of foreign wars and domestic rebellions in China in the mid 19th century that come out of this policy vacuum of the early part of the century within the within the empire uh, itself. There were changes elsewhere as well. Um, yesterday, you didn't hear me talk very much about Japan. I mentioned Japan, but I didn't talk about it very much. And, and, and of course, there is a reason for that, that Japan, with the exception of the wars in the late 16th and early 17th century, were relatively peripheral to what happens in the Sino-Korean relationship. That's no longer the case when we get into the middle part of the, uh, of the 19th century. And that change in terms of the status of Japan within the region is also connected to changes within Japan itself, which were different, again, in kind from what you saw in Qing China and Joseon Japan. Uh, a, a quicker commer commercialization from a relatively low starting point, but happening much more quickly in the late 18th century and early 19th century that you, than you saw, except in some parts of China. Um, and maybe first and foremost, a strengthening of the central state in Japan, even before the Meiji era. And that, I think, is important, because it, it points forward to what is to come uh, later on. Now, all of this was, was, was a slow process, or well, there were slow processes. But they were bound to influence Korea, simply because of where they were happening, right? So when you have a country that is not that far away, which goes through a very dynamic transformation of the way it works internally, of course this was going to have an impact with regard to the Sino-Japanese relationship, and especially on Korea itself. Though no one could foresee the format in which that would happen, because that, in my view, is intimately connected to what happens within China itself, what happens within the, within the Qing. Now, the Korean reaction to these beginning changes in Eastern Asia. So the British and French and American and Russian presence that is more visible than what it's been before, the changes that are taking place within Japan, the profound changes that seem to happen within China, was first and foremost an attempt to keep out unwanted influence from Joseon, from Korea very similar to what we talked about yesterday in other periods of crisis, and not an unnatural policy. Of course, Korean scholars and Korean leaders were concerned by China's weakness in the First Opium War and in the great rebellions of the mid 19th century, but they still believed that this would be a temporary phenomenon. It's very clear when you read Korean writings of the mid, even late 19th century, at least up to the 18th, 1870s, that many people expected this to be temporary. And that throws us back to the discussion that we started yesterday about the centrality of ideology within the Joseon state. And here that comes to be something that is really significant. Because it is really, as Kirk, point, Kirk Larson points out in his book, in terms of the ideological dependence, and here it's a dependence in a sort of general sense, more than a concrete sense, on China, on an idealized China. That was probably stronger in Joseon in the late 18th and early 19th century than what it had been for a very long time prior to that. Now, some of Korea's tragedy, I think, can only be understood by that particular phenomenon. Um, it was not an absolute phenomenon. There were different kinds of thinkers in Korea. But a number of people tended to underline China's place in the natural order of things in ways in the early and mid 19th century that they hadn't done for a very long time before. And one of these thinkers is a guy, a, a conservative uh, scholar by the name of Yi Hang No. And I just wanted to read to you, and it, it's actually a fairly long excerpt, but it's an interesting one, it's an important one in terms of understanding what the contention is about in late 19th century and even early 20th century Korea over the role of China. And this is E writing, I don't think we have an exact date for this, but it's, it's sort of 
towards the end of the 1840s, beginning of the 1850s, right? When things are really happening in China and things do not look good, right? So this is what he says. When Chinese civilization encounters a barbarian people, the barbarians are transformed by Chinese ways into a civilized people. Barbarians look up to China and are delighted to receive its civilizing influence. This is the way things are. This is the natural order of things. This is the way human beings ought to feel. China is like the root, the plant supplying nourishment for the branches and the leaves. It is like the hands and feet that protect the belly and chest of the human body. This can never change. These Europeans, still e-writing, these Europeans come from a land far away from China. So it's only natural that their customs are quite different from Chinese customs. Like children of peasant households, though they study Confucian writings as hard as they can, they can never quite grasp the structure and organization of these writings as well as children from families that have been studying Confucianism for generations. Unfortunately, the world is a very big place. Europe, therefore, has had no contact with China for quite a long time. This means, regrettably, that Europe was not introduced to the basic principles of the Great Tao, the, the white, the overall principles, and Europeans were not turned into more virtuous people by its civilizing power. Europeans do have a remarkable talent for technology. They easily surpass the Chinese in that area, but that achievement makes them arrogant, and they think that they can convert the whole world to their way of thinking. They need to think again. The heavens are vast, the universe appears boundless. Yet we can locate the center of the universe, the point around which it revolves. That is the North Star. The Earth is also quite large, extending so far in all directions that it too appears infinite in size. Yet it also has a center, the site from which the ent entire Earth is governed. That terrestrial center is China. There are also many different ways human beings can behave and interact, so many that they appear countless. But above all of them is the supreme ultimate, the way of ways. The North Star rules over the multitude of stars, so the multitude of stars all bow in the direction of the North Star. The Earth rules the 10,000 regions, so all of those regions recognize the paramount position of China. This is the one principle that unites everything in heaven, on earth, and among people. A long quote, but it's a good one. It signifies one form of thinking that was very much ingrained, not just in Korea, but throughout the East Asian region. It was not alone. It was not the only form of thinking, and let me underline that. I mean, even in the early part of the 19th century in Korea, it was not the only form of thinking, but it was a significant one. And without understanding that, I think it becomes very difficult to understand the disorientation that you find on the side of many Koreans in dealing with the changes in the, in the 19th century. Now, I'm not saying this. I'm not quoting uh, E in order to point away from what was brought up yesterday in discussion about the significance of a new form of Qing imperialism vis-a-vis -vis Korea. More about that in a second. There is real politik, there is power and power principles in the relationship between China and Korea, no doubt about it. But again, I don't think you can understand that with understand, without understanding the ideological fundament among a great number of people within the Korean leadership that this sense of closeness to China and the Chinese tradition was, was built on. So the Qing response with regard to imperialism in Eastern Asia was more or less to try to learn new techniques of how being an empire and how to be an imperialist. Now, one could argue, based on the history of the Qing, that they needed no lessons from others on this in terms of how to do it. They had been very good at expansionism themselves in many different directions and in many different ways. Uh, even so, there were a few tricks of the trade that they could, could pick up and they certainly 
did so in the late 19th century. The Qing Empire was not going to keel over and die, confronted with pressures from the outside. Um, quite on the contrary. Uh, what they engage in vis-a-vis -vis Korea is what you could call uh, an adaptive informal imperialism, which made use of very similar techniques to what the Europeans did, sending in advisors, for instance. So the, 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 the Joseon rulers are saying, you know, why are you sending these, these people to us? And the Qing response is basically, this is how empires operate. You are our vassal, you are, we are your, your, your sovereign, um, therefore we need to send in advisors to tell you how to behave. That's how empires do things, right? Look at how the Western empires behave in terms of their, their approach. Which, of course, is not the way the Koreans would see the relationship um, at all. So what the Qing is doing is to compete in many ways rather successfully at first with other imperialists that are trying to um, be seen within the Eastern Asian um, region. And this is particularly borne out by the Chinese reactions to the first foreign attempts uh, to break Korea open for, for trade and, and contacts with the outside world. Uh, and interestingly, of course, for what happened later, the first serious attempt at doing this came from the United States in 1866, when the US vessel, the General Sherman, sailed up towards Pyongyang, uh, demanding uh, to trade with the Koreans, and was attacked and burnt uh, by, Korean, by Korean forces. There is, I'm told, I haven't been, but I'm told there is a huge memorial that the North Koreans have put up uh, uh, to uh, remember this incident. And for a long while, the uh, US Navy ship Pueblo was uh, towed up the river and put right next to this memorial so that people should not forget that the American imperialists had tried to control Korea in many different ways and over a long period of time. Now, it is, of course, Japan that becomes the country that then is able to get the first treaty for pure power reasons with Korea, an enforced treaty by the Japanese in, in 1876, which opened Korea for trade, for foreign settlements, and also, crucially, got it, at least in the language as understood by the Japanese and most foreigners, to relinquish its status as a tributary of China. Now, many Koreans denied at the time and later on that that's actually what they did in the Treaty of Danghua, but that's the Japanese interpretation of it. And it's this treaty and it's, it's, its effects that lead to a redefinition of Korean politics in the last three decades of the 19th century, which Japan, uh, trying to position itself through the people it was working with in Korea as being seen, being in favor of fundamental reform of the Korean state and, and Korean society, building on Japan's own Meiji transformation. And a China that is trying to uphold its right, although in a fairly imperialist kind of way, with regard to influence in, in Korea. And of course, this had to lead to a conflict. We all know the result of that conflict in, in the war in 1894-95, which could be seen, since we know, know about this, right? We heard about it in the lecture yesterday, to be a kind of refighting of the great East Asian wars from 300 years earlier on. Um, it was also in many ways similar to the 1950s war. Um, and one of the things that these two have in common, maybe possibly differently from the Great East Asian Wars um, of 300 years before, was that they were Korean civil wars with much outside influence. Uh, they weren't just foreign wars over Korea. They were Korean civil wars with a significant contribution by, by foreigners. So much had Korea changed over a short period of time that this was not just possible, but seen by many Koreans as being, as being necessary. Uh, and it ended, as we know, with Japan's predominance over Korea and very significant parts of China, instituting a completely new form of colonialism vis-a-vis -vis Korea, which I mentioned yesterday, the first time Korea had encountered a settlement form of colonialism, right? So it's a new form of colonial influence coming from, from, uh, from Japan um, with very significant attempts 
at extinguishing the Korean identity and replacing it, uh, at least with a hybrid identity, uh, in which uh, there were very significant attempts at influencing this in the direction of Japanese customs and Japanese behavior, Japanese politics, and, and Japanese identity. Now, as very often happens, it is this foreign occupation and the attempts at colonization that gave rise to a new form of nationalism. Now, we can discuss, and it'd be interesting to do that later on also here, what, uh, what Ezra has to say about this. I located some of the basic formats of thinking about Korea as a nation much earlier in time than the time we are discussing now. But I do still think that as a nationalism, as a full-fledged idea of how a nation is produced and reproduced and, and situated, uh, that's something that only comes to the fore fully in Korea uh, with the, the Japanese occupation. The birth of Korean nationalism, therefore, was something that happened uh, mainly abroad, mainly in, in exile. Um, it emphasized all of these various forms of Korean nationalism, emphasized belief in a strong state in order to counter the, the, the attempts at, at, at colonial domination, the uniqueness and purity of Korean culture, and of course the need to be independent of, of foreign influence. But it did take, and this is where the Sino-Korean relationship is particularly important, the uh, Korean nationalism in the early 20th century did take two distinct forms. Both of them very intense, both of them created mainly in exile. Uh, one often connected to the name of, of Syngman Rhee, Lee Sung Man, uh, was the first Korean who, who got a, a foreign PhD degree from Princeton in, in 1910, and who taught about the Korea that he wanted to create after the end of the Japanese occupation as a Korea that bore in it the traditions of the past, at least some of them, but were supported by modern organization and modern technology in order to do so. So a kind of internal strengthening of, of the Korean state and, the, and of Korean society, but based on modern methodologies that was picked up from elsewhere. What became the alternative, very slowly and very gradually, was Korean communism. Uh, and this is, of course, where the Chinese connection comes in in particular, that all of Korean nationalism was influenced by Chinese examples to quite some, to quite some extent. Um, and part of this, of course, has to do with Korea and China during the 1920s and 1930s, the sense of a common enemy, uh, Japan, but also the number of Koreans who lived and worked in China, both in communist-held and especially, of course, in, in nationalist-held areas during this whole period up to the late 1940s. So even though Kim Il-sung, the, the man who becomes the, the leader of the new communist Korean state after the end of the Second World War, has most of his immediate background from the Soviet Union, he returns to Pyongyang as an officer in the Soviet Red Army. The connections between Korean communism and China do go, do go far back. And it's very interesting now, since we have the documents available, to look at some of the interwar documents from international sources, from the Soviet sources and from Comintern sources about Korean communism and to see how closely uh, much of what happens in the birth of Korean communism is linked to, to what happens in, uh, in China. I mean, Tony Sage, who is here, knows that period better than most. This is a really interesting period in terms of the formation of the, of the, 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 the formation of, uh, of Korean nationalism. Uh, the CCP itself, the Chinese Communist Party, is very uncertain if Korean communism should be regarded as being separate from China or should really form a part of a Chinese communist movement. Not, I think, to be fair to them, because they in any way plan to deny the statehood or nationhood of Korea, uh, but simply because they see what they do as being at the center of a development of communism in Asia, in which 
other countries, neighboring countries, play their own role, but linked into what happens in China itself. And that's important, I think, to remember uh, for what happens in the future as well. Now, inside Korea itself, the Japanese occupation had distinct effects on the Korean uh, views of China. I think it would be right to say, but again, we have people here in the audience who know much more about this than what I do, that part of the policy implemented by the Japanese in Korea was seen by many Koreans as deliberate attempts at breaking Korea's links with China. And there is something about this. I mean, you see similar uh, effects in Europe under German or Italian occupation that uh, sometimes the, the enemy of your enemy becomes your closest friend. So the more anti-Chinese propaganda you get in Korea by the Japanese, the more a lot of uh, Koreans who after the collapse of the Qing had had very little time for China, now again start to think about China as something that is closer to Korea or, or linked, linked to the country. There are, of course, also the effects of Koreans being introduced to Western-style modernity through Japan. And this is complicated both historically and, of course, also psychologically. I mean, on the one hand, many Koreans, and we know that throughout the 20th century, embraced modernity as liberating, both from old conventions uh, as well as from poverty and from social oppression. But on the other hand, modernity was introduced as a colonizing enterprise uh, in which Koreans were expected to fill a subservient role, which makes people ask questions about what kind of role these ideas will have for, for, for Korea itself. So Korean nationalism I think, should best be understood as first and foremost responding to the need to find a Korean modernity, uh, free from Japanese occupation and in communication with China's past. But also, therefore, to think about Korea's relationship with other states, first and foremost China, but also to some extent the Soviet Union, that were seen as the opponents of Japanese uh, colonial hegemony. Now, Korea, during the Second World War, became one of the minor issues that came to divide, um, at least up to a point, the West and others. There were different kinds of views of what would happen to Korea after the Second World War was over. In my mind, the Chinese nationalists, the Gomedan, have gotten far too little credit for the role that they played in constantly reminding the other allies of the need to reconstitute an independent, free, and whole Korea after the war was over. Uh, that was perhaps one of the most significant aspects of um, uh, Chinese nationalist foreign policy uh, during that era. And, and it was very, very successful. Uh, many of the wartime declarations about uh, Korea's independence after the war was over came out of ideas that the Chinese first had been pushing uh, with the, the other allies. What they could not foresee, of course, were the immediate effects of that very sudden, uh, almost cataclysmic Japanese capitulation when it came in, in August of 1945, and the US and Soviet liberation of Korea in military terms that took place after that uh, conflict was, was over. Kuomintang government in China had hoped, even expected, to assist with the liberation of Korea. And there are very interesting plans that were developed in Chongqing during the war in terms of trying to, trying to do that. But of course, in reality, uh, the Kuomintang was far too preoccupied fighting its own wars um, as the Great uh, Pacific War came to an end to be able to, to do that. So instead, what we get is a US and Soviet occupation, which leads, as we all know, to the development of two separate regimes within Korea itself. And in Korean and to some extent Chinese historiography, this is a division that was imposed on the country by the emerging superpowers along an arbitrary dividing line that was supposed to be entirely temporary, but then turned out to be, to be lasting. I think there is very good reason, not least when I speak to Korean audiences, to uh, take some exception to this particular historiography and the way that it is, it is presented. 
Of course, things are not that simple. As I've already said, by the time that the Second World War comes to an end and the Japanese um, empire as a project collapses, there were already two Korean nationalist projects. In fact, there were more than that, but there were two predominant ones, um, which were in conflict with each other. And neither of these two were willing to accept reunification on anybody else's terms than their own. Having worked a bit on this period, my view is that the two, if the two Korean regimes had agreed some kind of reunification or confederation at any point up to early 1948, the chances are quite likely that the superpower sponsors would have gone along with that, would actually have accepted it in one form or another. It is when the Cold War fronts harden in a global sense that the dividing lines in Korea become very difficult to deal with for reasons of superpower developments. And while all of this happens, China is on the sidelines, mainly due, due to its own civil war in the, in the late 1940s, which happens, by the way, with a significant Korean participation, first on both sides in Manchuria. There were Koreans fighting on both sides in the big battles for control of, of Manchuria during the Chinese civil war but then increasingly on the communist side, uh, because the Chinese communists were able to use North Korea as a kind of rear base when they come up to the most significant final battles in the Manchurian region. And this is something that is often referred to even today when you look at the relationship between the Chinese communists and North Korea. It's not just about the Korean War. It is also about the debt of gratitude that goes back to the Chinese Civil War and the number of people who were involved there. Now, this is not the place to recapitulate in any form the Korean War and, the, and its outbreak. But I'm just going to make three points with regard to this. The first one I've already made, uh, or at least in a rudimentary form, that this war has to be understood as a Korean civil war as much as it has to be understood as an international war. I mean, the best way to understand it, in my view, is as a civil war that, because of decisions that are taken, we'll get to that in a moment, become an international war and become increasingly internationalized as the war itself goes on. Secondly, there wouldn't have been a Korean war if it hadn't been, in, in terms of the way it is fought, if it hadn't been for the uh, international developments during the uh, late 1940s coming together with what happened on the, on the Korean side. So both sides are necessary. Stalin's role in the outbreak of the war, when it breaks out, is, is considerable. Stalin is the one who makes the decision, who, who grants Kim Il-sung his wish, to go ahead with uh, an attempt at reunifying his country by force. By the way, after Kim had made a number of requests to do so, which Stalin had turned down in 1948 and 1949, at least three of them. Um, but in the spring of 1950, Stalin gives the, the go ahead. Without that, the timing of the war is impossible to, to understand. And then thirdly and finally on the Chinese Communist decision to intervene in the Korean War. And this is something that my good friend Chen Jian and others have studied in depth. It's very interesting to look at that in terms of what we know today. So what generally has the upper hand in our understanding of the Korean War, uh, the Chinese intervention in it, is a kind of realist scheme that basically says the Chinese attacked in the end because American forces came too close to the Chinese border in the north. I mean, there were other reasons for it as well, but that was the main reason. And very often it is presented in the literature up to quite recently as uh, a, a case of uh, misunderstood signaling. I mean, the Chinese were attempting to signal uh, that they would not accept such an American or UN um, advance. The Americans ignored it, and bang, comes the Chinese intervention. Reality, of course, is much more complex than that, and we know a great deal about it. Um, the main correctives that I think are necessary there are maybe first and foremost linked 
to issues that have to do with the commonality of ideology, the emphasis in Beijing uh, within Mao's uh, leadership group of the need to intervene to save North Korea as a communist state, which was very, very strong. But also, and perhaps even more importantly, on the Chinese communist side, the sense of being responsible for revolution in Eastern Asia in general. China is at the center of this revolutionary experience, therefore not helping a younger brother. And this is actually the, the term that Mao uses himself in the October 1950 meetings that decides on this. A younger brother who is trying to do the same thing in Korea, namely unifying the country by force, as the Chinese themselves have been busy doing for the last five years in China, is out of the question. It is not acceptable. It is not how Mao argues we behave. So I think these issues need to be brought together, at least, with the realist in interpretation in terms of understanding the war. It's also interesting in terms of the new literature on the war, how relatively unpopular this war was in China. Now, in spite of the best attempts by the Chinese government to use nationalist propaganda, first and foremost against the United States, in order to justify the war, we know that there were significant unrest in parts of China simply because people were saying we had fought our own wars for almost 20 years. And with these wars over, what do you guys do? You march our young men off to fight in a war on foreign territory. This is not necessarily good. So there was a lot of attempts from the Chinese communist side to overcome this, some of which were successful, but others that left big question marks, I think, in the minds of many Chinese about the efficacy of CCP policies. Finally, then, let me deal a little bit in a broad sense, because I'm going to pick up more of this tomorrow, on the relationship with China in the creation of the two Korean states uh, post-war, post-Korean post War. So the creation or the recreation after the war of the North Korean state, of course, would not have happened the way it did happen without close links to China. But as we all know, the North Korean leadership under Kim Il-sung tried to balance throughout relations with China, which were probably more economically important throughout the North Korean experience in the first 30 years, with links with the Soviet Union, which were more strategically and militarily important. So trying to get that balance right was something that Kim uh, and the North Korean leadership engaged in for a very, very long time. And there were ups and downs in that relationship um, as well. Now, for South Korea, the relationship, of course, was, was very different. A different path of development. Um, Ezra has written about this. Others have written about it who are here today. Um, the coming together, the gradual coming together of what you could call collaborationist elites and traditionalist nationalists within South Korea that created, in the 1960s, the, the Park Chung-hee uh, regime, based on a, on a, on a development agenda. And the anti-communism of this agenda, of course, also meant a greater distance um, to China, and even more so in the 1960s, because Mao, Mao Zedong seemed so intent on undoing everything in the common past that South Korean elites identified with. So it's really at the end of the Maoist era that the relationship between China and Korea starts to reopen. Uh, and this will be close to Ezra's heart. Indeed, he has written very insightfully about this. Um, one of Deng Xiaoping's key preoccupations as he takes over power in China in the late 1970s is in rebuilding links with China's neighbors. And he does that in a way that to me seems to be pretty consistent. He emphasizes development in an economic and social sense over political rectitude in ways that are not entirely dissimilar from what happened in South Korea since the end of the Korean War, but of course very different from what happened uh, in the North. I would argue, and I've written about this in another context, that history stood in the way of normalization between China and South Korea as long as the Cold War lasted. But with the Soviet Union gone in the early 1990s, it was considerably easier for Deng and the Chinese leadership to move to a formal recognition 
of South Korea, which happened in 1992, uh, over, over, over North Korean protests, which were bloodly disregarded in Beijing. And the format, as all of you will know, many of you will know, the format under which this happened was the simultaneous admission of both of the Korean states to the UN. But in reality, and we know this from Chinese documents, the Chinese decision to recognize had been taken well before that happened. And it was a strategic decision about the significance of all of the Korean peninsula for China, which really pointed forward uh, to the situation that is there today. It's also interesting to look at how Chinese leaders viewed the democratization process in South Korea during the late 1980s and, and early 1990s. It's very clear from um, reading some of the works of some of the Chinese leaders, including one who, who Ezra is working on at the moment, Hui Abang, uh, that they were impressed with the democratic transition in, in South Korea, even though they did not plan anything similar for themselves. But what struck them is the process by which through economic progress, I mean, rapid economic pro pro progress that South Korea experienced during these years, it is possible to have a political change, a political transition uh, that is based on the economic and political successes of the immediate past, right? So um, that success uh, in, in South Korea, I think, is something that profoundly impressed people in China, even though they had no plans of carrying out significant political reform themselves. So in summing up uh, for today, I think what we've looked at now is a Korea that was forced out of the Chinese orbit and into a 20th century of great trials and, and tribulations. I often sort of half in joke used to say that, you know, the Koreans had a really bad 20th century. And it is true. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, Korea compared to a lot of other countries, overall, in spite of the economic successes in the South, towards the end of the century, things were not going their way. But of course, the very promise of a new kind of state and a new kind of economy in the South also opened up for new possibilities as the 20th century came to a close. So this is the transition I want to make to the discussion that we are going to have tomorrow. By the end of the 20th century, the relationship between China and Korea seemed again to be moving in a direction not similar to what was the situation in the 19th century, but where many of the same issues seem to come up again about what is going to happen inside Korea itself and about what is going to happen in the relationship between China and Korea. Will there be a new definition of that relationship? Not just a tinkering at the edges with the situation that happens before, but a new kind of relationship that is based on new realities as they develop within both of those two countries. But that is the uh, topic for the, for the lecture tomorrow. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So I want to break off there and open up for Ezra's comments. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege for a non-historian uh, to be uh, asked to join with a bunch of historians. I have uh, great respect for historians, but I've not done the original research that they have. I've learned a great deal, and as I see, as my role is to try to pr help provide a kind of broad perspective. Uh, when I first accepted uh, this uh, uh, to, uh, obligation, I thought that um, our speaker would give a broad, detailed history and that I would add some concepts. But he has brought the concepts, uh, and uh, so I can't do that. Uh, then I thought that, well, today I would bring in the Japanese angle because uh, that's what I've been working on, the broad history between uh, China and Japan, and then he brings in the Japanese angle. <clears throat> what I will do uh, and I'm so, so uh, I want to thank Michael also for arranging this series and uh, uh, Professor Westad, who has extraordinary breadth, linguistic breadth, and uh, we're lucky to have brought him to Harvard uh, through the Kennedy School uh, because of the great breadth of languages, 
uh, and understanding of history of so many different countries and providing such broad perspective as he has done in, in these lectures. So what I will do, I will try to give a main theme to how I interpret this period. Uh, and I will also uh, try to summarize what I think are three different periods in this uh, transition uh, of this time period we're talking about. Now, the uh, main theme comes from my good friend Kim Jong Won, who passed away uh, several years ago. Um, Kim Jong Won got his PhD here in 1964. He became a senior policy advisor uh, to Park Chung Hee. Uh, he was ambassador to the United Nations. He was ambassador to Washington. Uh, he was head of the Seoul Forum. He's head of the Daewoo Foundation. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, uh, several years ago. Um, he said uh, about the role of Korea, he said, um, to, for any nation to exist during the 2,000 years when the Chinese dominated the whole plains of that territory, they had to be very stubborn. We Koreans, he said, are very stubborn. Um, and I think the stubbornness is not just in the political stubbornness. The stubbornness is also in the righteousness. And I think this can be linked up with the theme here. For they kept, there was a persistence of ideas, not just a persistence, but a determination uh, and uh, not only were they going to resist, as Kurt Larson said yesterday, uh, and get their own way, uh, but they were also determined to preserve certain ideas. I remember Dewey Ming saying that uh, the Neo-Confucianism was probably stronger and persisted more in Korea uh, than it did in, in China. Um, and if you uh, look at uh, communism, uh, which uh, from the Soviet Union to China, uh, you couldn't accuse China of being too communist today, uh, but North Korea uh, still uh, quite persists uh, and is uh, quite co uh, uh, communist. Uh, those who work on Christianity uh, have said that the Christians in uh, uh, Korea are much more, much stronger Christians uh, than uh, the Westerners, and even in the United States, you could argue that the Koreans are much stronger in their Christianity uh, than we are. So I think uh, there's a very interesting persistence of ideas uh, and a, a stubbornness in sticking to those ideas uh, that uh, really characterizes Korea. And uh, <clears throat> I think that stubbornness uh, perhaps has two, the ideas perhaps has two main functions. One is it's a way of gaining <clears throat> respect from the society you worked with. I mean, to be so Confucian and to master Confucianism uh, the way the Chinese did. It was a way of gaining respect in the days of the empire uh, and of learning, uh, say, the Japanese and uh, performing so well as they did. Uh, and. Uh, I should add that, of course, uh, the Koreans also kept the ideas from Japan, as Carter Eckert has shown. Uh, Pak Chun Hee, uh, who became extremely Japanese, has kept the principles uh, that he learned in the Manchurian uh, um, Academy uh, much, much greater than many others do. The other uh, function, I think, of that persistence of uh, uh, their, their righteousness, in addition to gaining favor, is it provides a kind of coherence and a perspective for all the complexity that they had uh, in uh, dealing with all the issues uh, that they have in a very divided and troublesome time uh, when, and when they went through the period when they called themselves a shrimp among whales. <clears throat> and what I thought I would do now is to describe what I think is sort of if I divided this uh, broad period into sort of three uh, periods, how I would divide those periods in terms of sort of the political uh, leverage and also in terms of what that meant. <clears throat> uh, the first one I would call the transition from uh, <clears throat> empire where they had suzerainty over Korea to actual control, and I would date that at about 1882. 
and uh, have that lasting uh, for a period up until about 1895. <clears throat> and during that period, when I uh, argue that that, uh, that change from suzerainty, why, why it changed, uh, from 1636 to 1862, the Chinese did not send any troops into the Korean Peninsula. There were none. Even though there was an empire, they made no effort. And as, as suzerainty, of course, during that period, they had the control theoretically over foreign policy, but they didn't interfere with uh, domestic events. But in 1862, they sent troops. Why did they send troops? Well, first of all, because the Japanese uh, sent in troops. And the, the thing that started the issue in 1862 uh, <clears throat> was something similar to what happened at the Satsuma Rebellion in Japan. The Satsuma Rebellion was in making way for the new army the old army, the old swordsmen were uh, disenfranchised and uh, they lost their power. And uh, in 1862, some of the Korean old soldiers who were being displaced became very disgruntled. And so they had a bit of a rebellion and then the Japanese sent in troops and then the Chinese sent in troops for the first time uh, since uh, 1636. So. We have a, a new role for China in Korea where they take on a much greater <clears throat> military role and a direction. And then several years later, when Japan uh, tries to send in people um, and people friendly to Japan, and I think particularly in 1884 when Kim Okyung uh, tries to rebel and start up a program that's similar to Japanese modernization, and he's put down. And then the Chinese uh, send in more troops. Uh, and then uh, by that time, their leader is Yuan Shikai. And so even though Koreans and uh, I mean Chinese and Japanese then try to avoid a continuing conflict, and to avoid it, can, can, they say that troops from both sides should get out of there, but the Chinese were very clever. They left Yuan Shikai, put him in charge of commercial uh, affairs, but of course he could always call on the military too. So this is the same Yuan Shikai who after the 1911 revolution would play such a big role uh, in China, was already playing a very strong role in China, so in, in Korea. So. Uh, during that period then, I would say from about 1882 until 1895, uh, China was playing the role of a very strong nation, sort of giving directions uh, to Korea. It was not yet united, didn't have a plan of modernization that was really in place, uh, but it was a kind of a military control. And then 1895, I would say, that's the beginning of Japanese empire. Because even though it was 1905 before they acquired the general rights, uh, and 1910 before they took over the colony and colonized, uh, they had already, I think, after that Sino-Japanese War, when they so they defeated uh, China in Korea, uh, and they really began to exercise the dominant power after 1895. So then I, I think one could call this a period of Japanese imperial control over Korea, which lasted uh, right up until 1945. So from, I would argue for that half century, uh, the uh, Japanese really had an, or the empire and China was already very much the outside. And as you say, um, uh, Professor Westad, they try to keep the, ja the Chinese out. And by keeping the Chinese out during that period, uh, the Japanese exercised such tight control. And of course, the Japanese empire was really very different from, I think, uh, empires, other, most other empires. And I liked Professor Westad's comments yesterday about Ireland uh, and France and Algeria because it was a nearby locality and the Japanese imperialism uh, uh, colonization went much deeper than China's did and almost any other country. And uh, I think the model really was 
uh, uh, from their development of Hokkaido, where they sent in so many outsiders and wanted to go through every aspect of education and uh, ro uh, infrastructure and industry and building up. So the Japanese imposed a much deeper empire uh, than China <clears throat> and Japan, uh, that China had exercised in Korea before. And during that period, what's the role of China? Um, I think as Professor Westad said, uh, Kim Il-sung and others were there. So it became a kind of refuge for Koreans who were unhappy with Japan. So um, there are probably people who uh, Carter would know and Professor Lee would know uh, who've investigated the role of Yenji. Uh, for example, uh, a city just across the border from North Korea, where a lot of intellectuals from Korea uh, who didn't like Japan went, and that provided a very lively intellectual center. And then Kim Il-sung uh, was very much the same way. It was a center for building up communism <clears throat> that would later, just as the United States provided uh, leadership for uh, uh, Syngman Rhee, so Kim Il-sung took refuge in China, so that China, I think at that stage, they were out on the immediate uh, effort on Korea, uh, but they were laying a basis uh, for what they would uh, do at a, at a later time. <clears throat> then I would say, uh, if I had quickly, the, the third period from 1945 up to 1992, I would say it's... Uh, China is a nation. It's no longer an empire. And of course, during the Cold War, uh, it was primarily associated uh, with North Korea. Uh, and North Korea uh, was under somewhat under uh, Chinese rule when, when Korea was very badly divided. <clears throat> but uh, just to, to come full circle to what I see as my main theme, uh, that Korea remained very stubborn, and even though it was not fully united, uh, the North Koreans, uh, and I think it will come out in tomorrow's lecture, uh, that were not a pushover, either for the Soviets or for the Chinese. They remained very stubborn, that, that streak of stubbornness, and they re retained their own you know, view of what is the righteous way uh, in uh, uh, North Korea, and they did that uh, in a very strong way. And uh, I hope uh, Carter will write about this, and he knows much more about this than I will ever know. But the way I would interpret Pak Chung-hee uh, in some of his efforts to modernize was to thumb his nose at the United States, too. The United States was supposedly in charge of controlling what was going on uh, in modernization in South Korea, and he said, to hell with it. Uh, he wanted to do it, a lot of it, in Japanese style. Uh, and he went, and there was a very stubborn streak there, too, that I think is consistent. So uh, that's my uh, quick two cents on how I, as a non-historian, would sort of try to characterize some of the main periods of this era that Professor Westad has uh, talked to us about, and how I would uh, in interpret sort of a continuing strain of relationships uh, that still exist today between China and Korea. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Ezra. If, if, uh, if only we historians could know as much about history and think as carefully about history as you as a non-historian, our profession would be in, would be in good hands. Um, just quickly, one of the lessons I think I take from, from your comments is that um, you should be very careful about allowing intellectuals into your country. Uh, you've, ri you've written about the Chinese intellectuals in Japan who will bring down the Qing or contribute to the bringing down of the Qing, uh, and now the uh, Korean nationalists in China who uh, contributed to the, to the, uh, uh, the downfall of the Japanese Empire. Um, we're open for questions. We have about uh, 40 minutes. Um, I might actually lead off, um, Arna, with a question for you. It wasn't the main uh, focus of of uh, of the the the, the lecture, but I'd, I'd like to probe you a little bit on an, an inconsistency I detected in your treatment of the 19th century. Mm. Um, probably in in terms on the Chinese side, probably the most revisionist 
part of your argument today was this idea of the Qing is actually quite an effective imperialist power, that it learned the new imperialism and then applied it in, in Korea. And Ezra talked about that a little bit as well. This certainly squares very well with, I think, the new research on Xinjiang after the reconquest, where we see Zhou Zongtang's followers kind of learning all these new ways about, about, about governing a country, uh, about governing a colony, really. Um, but, that, 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 but that argument doesn't sit so well with the argument you started with about the collapse of leadership and the lack of, of uh, will. So what is, are, the, are the mid to late 19th century uh, leaders, both emperors and, and top officials, effective or hopeless? So I think I mean, the, 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 this is really not all that provisionist in any way, but I, I think it still could be underlined more in the literature is that what you do get after the end of the Great Rebellions is a new elite in China which is far more capable of handling the empire's affairs, though in very different ways, from what their predecessors in the early part of the 19th century had been. And as you know mm -hmm. from the literature, there are of course a number of different suggestions as to why this is so. Uh, the most straightforward one, you know, the, there's always this set of little facts that can destroy a great theory. And the, 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 easy, the easy little facts here is, of course, that people learn, right? They learn over time. They saw what had gone wrong in the early 19th mm -hmm. century, and they didn't want to go back there. Even so, I must say that I find the rejuvenation to the irritation of a lot of people around inside and outside of China of the uh, Qing Empire as an active imperialist in the late 19th century to be very, very striking. Yeah. I think we need to underline it, underline it more. Because as you indicate in your question, Michael, it happens on, on a very grand scale. You know, and with resources that really are very limited and under constant pressure for, from other better armed, better developed imperialists from outside the region and increasingly also from, uh, from Japan. When I lecture on this, I often, it doesn't always go so well with an American audience, but I, I, I'm a great Monty Python fan. And I use this, um, this scene with the, with the knight from the, the, the Holy Grail. And some of you have seen this. So first he gets his arms chopped off, you know, and he continues to fight with his legs. And then he gets his legs chopped off. And then he has his sword between his teeth and he cries out, come back and fight me, you coward. You know? <laughs> Uh, I still have life in me. That's a little bit like the Qing Empire towards the end of the 19th century. Right? A little bit like the Koreans, too. And, and very much like the Koreans in terms of their stubbornness, as you rightly pointed out, Professor Wolber. So I, the, the point here is that this was, I mean, as they were throughout their existence, I mean, th th this is an important point in terms of what I said yesterday as well. The Qing capacity for learning and for overcoming challenges and reinventing itself is really very, very striking. Yeah. I'm, and you see that in, in earlier issues that I dealt with in the lecture uh, yesterday, but you probably see it nowhere more than you do in the late 19th century. Right. You know, they give other imperialists a pretty good um, run for their money. So to, to cut back to the Monty Python scene, it's just a flesh wound. It is a flesh wound. <laughs> Clearly, not a lot of Monty Python no, fans no, in the I, audience. I, 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 that's that's okay. <laughs> the floor is the, British Canadian. Canadian. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right. Other questions or comments? Please. Um, I really uh, learned a lot and enjoyed. Uh, to talk today, uh, I'm a I'm not a historian or sociologist, uh, but literature person. But um, a couple of things uh, jumped out at me uh, during today's talk, and one of them was uh, what you said about uh, the Sino-Japanese War was actually a civil Korean civil wars and also the uh the korean war is uh in um essentially a civil war 
I, I assume that I wasn't <laughs> able to attend yesterday's lecture, but I uh, assume that you were talking about the Imjin War also as a civil war. And um, I am a little, uh, I think that's an unusual claim that to say. I, I, I wouldn't claim it for the Imjin Wars. I mean, I, 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 but I would claim it very strongly for the 1890s wars and the Korean mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would uh, like your elaboration on that a little bit. And another question um, was uh, another uh, argument. Maybe you made it very uh, tentatively, but the, there might have been a chance of Korean uh, remaining as one nation uh, uh, briefly uh, before the Cold War hardened. Uh, and I think in that period, actually, the main uh, major players were not China or Japan, but uh, United States and Soviet Union. So uh, as someone who um, studied that period a little bit re related to literature, I, uh, I also feel strongly that there actually could it, it wasn't an option, uh, the, the way U.S. and Soviet Union entered the country very determined uh, not to give an inch to each other. Uh, it might not have been an option. Uh, that's how I, f I feel. So any, any response? Absolutely. Good. You yeah. Yeah. Uh, on that, no, I mean, uh, uh, I do think... I mean, of course, part of the problem with the Imjin war or wars is that it's really difficult to carry out the kind of research that we can do on later events. I mean, in terms of understanding the Korean involvement, but I I would not, based on what we know today, characterize that as a civil war. I mean, I I, I see that as incursions that happen from the outside, um, and a very slow developing, but still very concerted and in the end very unified Korean response, uh, based, uh, as I said yesterday, around principles that have to do with unique or perceived unique Korean forms of righteousness, right? As you as you know, in terms of the slogans that were used during the during the uh, late uh, 16th century wars. On on the 1890s and, and the Korean War, I think it's pretty clear that these were civil wars at least up to a point. I mean, I think it's undeniable that Koreans, you know, served on both sides uh, with regard to the conflicts that took place, even though in both cases there were foreign troops fighting on Korean territory. Um, for the 1890 90s war, I think it's hard to argue, at least I find it hard to argue, that that was a civil war in the form that it would not have happened if it weren't for what happened on the Korean side. I think it's quite likely that China and, and, and Japan would have come to blows over influencing Korea, even if there hadn't been much of a Korean involvement. Now, as we know, there was significant Korean involvement, but I mean, even if that had not been the case, I think that war might have happened. With the Korean War, I'm not so sure. Um, I think there is a great deal of hesitancy that I find in the historical record on both the US and the Soviet side until very late in the game with giving in to the pressures that happens on both sides. It happens in the South as well as in the North with the idea of reunifying the country by force. And the reason for that was not, I think, that the leadership in Moscow and Washington necessarily uh, would not support their uh, Korean allies. It was simply that their attention was elsewhere. I mean, Korea simply was not regarded as being significant enough for a war to break out that necessarily would get the attention of the emerging superpowers. So I think that was the, that was the hesitancy. Now, the early phase uh, in, in 1945, 46, I argued here, 47, maybe as late as even early 1948, is based on the documents that we now have available, both from, from uh, the US side and the Soviet side, in terms of the thinking about Korea. Now, I'm not indicating that this would have been an easy reunification process, uh, even if it hadn't been for the two Korean parties 
rejecting it. I mean, even as a, even as a starting point for for negotiations, it, it it wouldn't have been the case. But the same preoccupation with events that happen elsewhere, and the need to move away from hindrances in their mutual relationship that were seen as being less significant, such as Korea, uh, I think could have opened up for an acceptance of forms of reunification from the side of the United States and the Soviet Union. I do not think it is correct to say that when they came in and took over the occupation zones in 1945, they were set, either, either one of them, on a lasting division of Korea. Uh, I think that happened much later. and I think it came when the Cold War hardened in a, in a sort of global, global sense. But of course, it's speculative to think about how far uh, these attempts at reunification could have gone if there had been more of a Korean willingness to reunify. That's an open question. I, I just want to say that my understanding of the uh, war in 1894-95 is exactly as yours. It didn't stem primarily from domestic mm. uh, causes, but from Sino-Japanese causes. The Japanese had been building up their military all along, uh, and uh, when they first uh, tried to challenge the Chinese uh, after 1884, the Chinese came in and you know did away with them. But then the Japanese kept building up, and so they were much stronger uh, by the time of the 1894-95. And uh, also, uh, I think that uh, when the, the killing of Kim Ok Kyun uh, just uh, on the eve of the Sino-Japanese War, you know that was the Japanese guy. Uh, who so I think it was situation was somewhat you could argue maybe polarized within Korea between uh, the those who were more pro Japanese and those who were against him, uh, but I think uh, that's my understanding. Carter, did you did you want to comment on that one too? Uh, sorry. characterization of the 1895 war as a civil war because uh, I may be wrong I haven't gone deeply into the documents there but it seems to me that um, it was essentially a war between Japan and, and, and China and the Korean involvement was minimal I mean the the Korean state was essentially coerced by the Japanese into doing whatever the Japanese uh, wanted them to do to support the war effort and then there were some uh, Koreans uh, again a very relatively small number uh, who were involved in the uh, Japanese army who were fighting um, alongside uh, again a very a very small small group. This was in connection with a group called the Il Chin Hui, which you've probably heard of. But I, apart from that, I mean, the, the involvement of Koreans to the point that you would call this a civil war in any sense just doesn't um, ring true to me. I, could I comment on that? I mean, I, so I think, and this was the distinction I tried to make in the, in, in the response to the last question. So if you think about the war qua warfare, I mean, the actual war itself in terms of how it is conducted and how it is fought, that is undoubtedly right. But when it comes to the circumstances that led to the outbreak of the war, I mean, the divisions that existed within Korean society with regard to or the Korean elites, with regard to the relationship, or relative relationship to Japan and to, and to China, clearly that was something that premeditated the war in a way. That was, a, that was part of the framework for what, why this conflict came about in the first place. So I should have expressed myself clearer on that. But that is my understanding of the link between civil conflict in Korea and the war. It's not so much the war fighting itself. Sorry. I just had a point, a small point. Oh, OK. Just a, a quick follow-up to this, and then we'll go to your question, if that's all right. Sure. I think Professor Wester's point is that affairs within Korea provided the catalyst for the armed intervention between Japan and China, purportedly in the name of restoring peace and stability per the Treaty of Tianjin of 1885, the Tongak Armed Rebellion. So the unrest and the armed rebellion uh, provided the catalyst for the armed intervention by the big powers. I just want to add, st stating the obvious, uh, one point to your observation with respect to the reasons for the Chinese intervention in 1950. Of course, just uh, watching on the sidelines as the political construct called the DPRK was falling would have had grave negative implications for Mao, who was, as you pointed out, 
universally seen as the leader of the Asian revolutionary movement, it would have had direct negative consequences, implications on his real plan to liberate Taiwan as well, and the formation of a united Korean government that would be pro-US, right on China's you know, Northeast Asian backyard, uh, would have been a, a very unwelcome development. So the ideological proclivities to use force to complete the Chinese revolution were very strong back then. Uh, what you did not mention uh, is that China also had a plan B in the Soviet Union. Stalin was not as forthcoming or generous as Mao may have wished in the Korean War, but that was a major factor. So stronger ideology, real intent to liberate Taiwan, uh, a supporter, perhaps a patron in the Soviet Union, and the lack of communication between the US and China, as you rightfully mentioned. None of those conditions are in place today. So when one hears, as we do often, that China will automatically use force against Americans and South Koreans in the case of an instability situation in North Korea, I think that is an assumption that needs to be investigated because we're no longer, we're nowhere near that stage, of course, but there are, you know, it's plausible that events in North Korea, if they become a direct security threat to China, China may come to recalculate it, its interests in the Korean Peninsula and be more willing to wave bye-bye to the DPRK and deal with a united Korea that will remain, of course, pro-US, but also of necessity remain very much pro-China. Yeah. Could, could I just comment very briefly on that comment? Um, that's an extremely good point, and it's a point that really links very much to the discussion that we are going to have tomorrow with, with you, uh, Professor Lee, as the respondent. I will just add to that one thing. I mean, what we must never forget is how close a call the Chinese decision to intervene in October 1950 actually was. I mean, if it hadn't been for Mao Zedong putting all of his personal authority on the line, to force his colleagues to go along with the plans for intervention. It just would not have happened. Uh, it is actually the first time we see this within the Chinese communist leadership that Mao presents a case in which he knows that the majority is against, right? uh, by basically saying, trust me, because I've always been right in the past, which they eventually do, but after a lot of pressure. So this idea that there was something uh, entirely necessary foretold structural in a sort of realist sense about the Chinese intervention. That's what we need to get away from, because as you correctly point out, that has very negative uh, effects on our understanding of China's options today. The Chinese intervention, of course, also, in a sense, to coming back to your point, backfires mm. in that it, it makes the liberation of Taiwan, exactly. it, it pushes it off indefinitely. Um, so there, there, there's also the question of the, the extent to which there is learning from that that may shape the future. Go one step further in history, which will thank him in front of the future. Thanks, thanks for your patience, sir. Let's talk to you. No problem. Um, Professor Westhead uh, just mentioned a very, um, very, very interesting uh, observation about uh, uh, democratization in South Korea, that, that, that China was very much impressed. Uh, by the political progress and then also uh, uh, economic success. And um, I'm just wondering uh, what kind of view the Japanese uh, had at that time. And uh, another question is how uh, the concept of righteousness uh, played out uh, in this particular time moment. I mean, uh, the, that concept, concept uh, played out very importantly uh, domestically uh, without particular relationship with uh, China, but uh, how China viewed it uh, from that angle and then, or uh, from another angle. That's right, do, do you want to do the Japan side, Japanese views of South Korea's democratization? Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, Japan, uh, the uh, occupation uh, forces had been there earlier uh, and completed in 1952 already uh, before the Korean uh, you know, War, just as the Korean War was ended. And um, I think Japan was very deeply committed to democratization by that time. 
and uh, that they were very sympathetic. But at the same time, uh, Japan was expanding economically, and they viewed the old connections with Koreans as very useful for selling their industrial goods. And um, even though the Koreans had been very stubborn and resistant to Japan, um, my, in my view, the Koreans were extremely ambivalent about Japan. Many of them were <laughs> more Japanese than the Japanese. Uh, and they, they knew Japan, they spoke it uh, well, uh, just as uh, in Taiwan, Li Deng Hui, uh, you know, spoke Japanese better than he did Chinese. Uh, so in uh, Korea, many of the Japanese, uh, many of the Koreans could write Japanese and talk Japanese and think in Japanese ideas and familiar with the literature and history in an extraordinary way. So I think that the connection with uh, between <clears throat> Japan and Korea in the 1950s was very uh, deep. It drew on uh, all the connections that had developed uh, during Japanese uh, occupation. Uh, and there were many Koreans who were well educated uh, in Japan at the universities as well as the private schools. Uh, and uh, by that time, the Japanese were very committed to democratization and were happy to work with uh, democracy in South Korea uh, and uh, also to promote their own business. Now, on this issue of um, the concept of righteousness in the, in the sense of fidelity to, 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 print, to, to common principles, right? Um, I myself was struck during, during that time, and I was, I've been struck over the last weeks in Korea, the, the potency that this concept and concepts connected to it have in, 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 the, in, in the Korean political discourse. Uh, I'm going to speak more about that tomorrow, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But it is really interesting to reflect, and this was new to me until I started looking at the documents, on how the Chinese leadership going through their own period of reform, but without the intention of any serious or, or deep political reform, at least on the side of most of the leaders, still, it's almost as if uh, some of them take some pride in what is happening in South Korea, because it shows that a society that they see as being connected to China historically and culturally is able to carry out a broad period of reform in ways that are tremendously successful, even though they shy away from the, from the democracy implications of it. I find that extremely interesting. Um, and if I'd had more time in, in these lectures, I would have developed it further, but maybe at some other point. Yes, please. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, either of, of the uh, uh, professors uh, or could comment on the, the role that uh, monetary policy has been playing in the, these two countries during the, especially during the, uh, the phases in which uh, planned economies, this is communist, conventional communist communism has been uh, in, in control. Uh, and and also uh, in China, it's subsequent to uh, the you know the 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 Nixon Kissinger opening and the 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 Deng reforms, this is, I say I mean because I would think that uh, that in a planned economy that they would attempt to balance money supply with supply of goods and services, and so uh, theoretically avoid the problems of either deflation or inflation. But uh, I'm under the impression that, for example, uh, in, in a, a, per, a peripherally related case, uh, Soviet Union and Russia, after the Soviet Union, there were uh, acute shortages of cash, uh, which which would have caused some kind of problem uh, it, it, with, with uh, supplies. And and uh, and and uh, I mean, there there have been reports of acute shortages of goods. In, in China, I mean, during the, the Cultural Revolution, there's they, starvation, I mean, there were there shortages of, of food. So, uh, they, well, that's, that's the question. You know, did, did they pay any kind of lip service to any kind of uh, generic e monetary 
theory, and if so, what, and with what success? Um, I, I, I don't know what specifically about monetary theory, but broad economic uh, efforts. Uh, in the 1950s, when North Korea was very cleverly using competition between the Soviet Union and China, their, their economy was doing pretty well. And because uh, their economy um, had much more of an industrial base than South Korea, and the Japanese had, of course, built their large industry in the hydroelectric power and the chemical fertilizer plants, largely in North Korea. South Korea was largely agricultural at the time when uh, uh, Korea, uh, when the uh, Korean War ended. Uh, during the 1950s, the North, uh, with their economic planning, was doing very well, and the economy was ahead of that of South Korea. It was really under Pak Chung-hee, uh, who came in in 1959, who really remade the economy, and within a decade, things had taken off, and it was really much more along the lines of Japanese planning. He relied much more on Japanese guidance than he did uh, American guidance in building the economy. And so Japanese textile firms started coming in, and when they first, uh, you know, the uh, transition from high wage to low wage that went from, uh, you know, Lowell, Massachusetts to the South the United States to Japan, and then went to Korea just at this uh, time, South Korea in the 1960s, and later went to China as uh, industrial skills uh, chased after lower wages. Uh, so, uh, Pak made first use of that in the light industry and then moved very uh, cleverly into heavier industry very quickly, uh, again, very much with Japanese uh, aid in and industry uh, and shipbuilding and steel. Uh, it was very much the planned economy along J Japanese lines so that even though the Japanese empire had ended uh, in 1945, uh, the economy of South Korea really grew very much uh, under uh, Japanese-style uh, modernization. Oh, no, okay, there was a question here. Thank you very much for this stimulating lecture and following the early question related to the righteousness and uh, if, uh, we bring this discussion to yesterday. You talk about the three key concepts, the empire, nation, and righteousness. And the, during this period we are discussing today, the empire fell mm -hmm. and the, the nation rise. But on the other hand, the righteousness has become very complicated. We see uh, maybe that's related to uh, Professor Vogel was talking about the persistence of uh, stubbornness. In ideas, uh, we see the, the, f the f lack of uh, gradual losing influence of Confucianism at least in, in China. Then you, you see the rise of Christianity in Korea, and uh, you s also found the communism, and uh, as well as imperialism, to some extent, the uh, late Qing period and uh, from Japan. And today, perhaps, what really link uh, the two countries, even including Japan's three countries together, is the ideas of develop developmentalism, and I have to add uh, maybe nationalism. And uh, so this is a period of very complicated story about how to find the, the most uh, suitable say, target, uh, a principle for to pursue righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering how you and uh, uh, the committee can comment on this. Thank you very much. I'm going to just talk about the question briefly. Somebody Sorry? Is, I want to talk yeah. about the question yeah, yeah. briefly. Is, is uh, a righteousness and stubbornness synonymous <laughs> in this context? <laughs> maybe, a re maybe rectitude <laughs> and stubbornness. Uh, it would be interesting to hear what, uh, what Professor Vogel has to say on that. I mean, my... So I don't want to go too deeply into what we're going to do tomorrow, but I, the, maybe this is a transition as far as I'm concerned uh, to, to what we will be discussing. So to me, what is really significant about the situation between China and Korea today are these many echoes of the past. So the past is there but in forms that people try to make fit in to their purposes in the present. I mean, that's the general human condition, I think, in overall, in overall terms. But it's particularly important, and that was my final point in the lecture today, when you are facing a situation of great change, right? 
when things are starting to move very, very quickly. Now, I'm not going to argue tomorrow, but just to give that away, um, that what we are seeing is a return to some of the concepts of the pre-mid-19th century situation. But it is a return to some extent to the circumstances that made these concepts so significant for so many people within the region. Uh, in terms of cohesiveness, in terms of links between states, and first and foremost, as you pointed out in your, in your question, the links that exist between concepts of development, growth, uh, societal uh, reformation, and these echoes of the deeper past, what people really regard their role in society and in the state to be, and first and foremost, given the, the topic of, of, of this lecture series, how do then states, when they reconceptualize their foreign relations, think about these particular conceptual echoes of the past? So that's what I'm going to explore tomorrow. Uh, I think Professor Westhead was quite right in righteousness uh, to describe. And, and uh, what I see in South Korea is such a powerful concern with righteousness that they haven't been uh, giving sufficient um, leeway to the realities of governing and running businesses. Uh, if you think uh, of, uh, they say, the student movements during the day of Pak Chung-hee when he was modernizing uh, China, the, the stubbornness and the, uh, of the intellectuals and, you know, uh, those of us who were intellectuals in America, of course, agreed with them. Uh, but they were extremely stubborn and very righteous in resisting uh, uh, Pak Chung-hee. And now uh, they have been very unkind to their ruler. I mean, they're so concerned with righteousness that the leaders get put in jail uh, after they've... Uh, uh, try to do their job, and they they don't con they don't make uh, uh, adjustment to the realities of a little uh, uh, corruption, a little uh, what uh, Tanaka <laughs> Tanaka Kakoe uh, said in Japan uh, that uh, you know business people receive commissions. Why shouldn't we politicians receive commissions? <laughs> um, and I think Korea has not made enough adjustment, and even. Somebody like Jay Lee, who got his MA here, a wonderful young man uh, when he was here as a student, later became president of Samsung, is now in jail because apparently Samsung paid uh, some money to the government. Uh, that's just par for the course in most countries of the world. But I think the, the, uh, the conviction about righteousness goes so deep. It's not a unified conviction of righteousness are different. There is a uh, military, dedicated military soldier. There is a, uh, the intellectual. Uh, but the, the sense of righteousness, I think he really captured something uh, that's still extremely powerful in South Korea. Mm. We'll so, have time for one last question in the back. Too much righteousness yes. is not a good thing. Yes. <laughs> I guess for the last question, I will ask some kind of big question about um, this 20th century Sino-Korea relations. And um, it's really, um, you, you gave a really uh, coherent stories of Sino-Japanese, uh, Sino-Korea relations. And, um, but from my understanding of your lecture, you kind of pointed more of this friendly relations between, uh, you know, Korea and China over, and I agree, I totally agree that, you know, China play a very important role in, you know, Korea's, um, you know, um, history, um, especially in the early 20th century and throughout the um, later 20th century. And so, uh, but then of course, you also talked about this, you know, Qing as an imperialist power in Korea. Of course, there was a, you know, kind of a embedded tension and conflict as well. I think especially, you know, Korea's, um, you know, this Korea, Korean community in Manchuria, for example, their context, I think, created a lot of conflicts, as you probably know. And then, of course, Professor Shin Ju-hwa would point it out that, you know, this brotherhood between North Korea and, and, and uh, China is a myth, right? Uh, there's a, you know, a, a, some tensions embedded. Um, and so, you know, I was wondering how, I mean, it might be quite difficult, uh, but how would you characterize this Korea's relations with uh, China, uh, especially in the 20th century? And I think uh, this uh, question will be important to understand current situation. Um, 
so that that's the I mean we're dealing with different transitions here but that's a, that's a really good one to what we're gonna do tomorrow so I think one of the things that I've been saying in these two first lectures very much as you just observed is that what is at play in Korea is very often an ideal China rather than a real China. And in my limited experience with Korean society, I have encountered that same myself on, on a number of occasions. Uh, as soon as one starts talking about what the real existing China actually does or thinks and the modes in which it behaves, uh, especially among younger South Koreans, you know, the, the, um, the criticism, even resentment is, 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 is very obvious. But if one thinks about the, if you ask questions about the overall relationship between China and Korea, the answers you get are overall or have been up to very, very recently, very positive. So I've always interpreted that is in part I, an implicit uh, uh, comment on the problematic relationship between Korea and Japan, right? China is the Japanese other. It's not Japan. It's in a way anti-Japan in, 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 in the view of many, many Koreans. But also, obviously, because of the past. I mean, because of the deeper past. Because of, of, of uh, sharing an enormous amount of uh, cultural and language traits uh, that do connect these two countries. But, so it's very easy. This doesn't just happen in Korea and the relationship to China. You can see this in other countries as well uh, on, a, on an almost global scale that brought two versions of a mighty country that is very close to you. There is the ideal version, what you want them to be, what you think they might have been at one point, and then there is reality of how they actually behave towards you today. So that's what I'm going to explore in the, in the, in the final lecture. Uh, I won't be on the program tomorrow, so I'll put in my two cents uh, <laughs> today. Um, I think that you know the imperial past, where China was this imperial nation and uh, Korea was the, the younger brother, uh, has still affected uh, Chinese attitudes both toward the north and to the south, and that it's going to run into more trouble. It's already run into some trouble, and it's going to continue to do that. I think in in the north, uh, you know, the big brother and uh, trying to help the North Koreans begin to open up the economy. They took them uh, down to visits to see what the market economy after uh, Deng came to power after 1992. Uh, and it didn't take, uh, at least not yet. And uh, in the South, I think now, uh, of course, China is doing business with South Korea and it's on a big scale. Uh, and yet, the, uh, China has recently tried to use economic sanctions on South Korea to, in order to follow the political uh, uh, line that uh, Beijing would like. And South Korea is... Uh, I think still very stubborn. So I, I think that they're going to continue to run into problems uh, both in North and South Korea, even though that China has moved from a communist country uh, to a more open uh, market economy. So that's my two cents. Uh, we've had very interesting discussions both days, but very different diff discussions both days. I, I, I have the sense that the discussions today touched more of a nerve with people that they were related, more related to questions of identity and so on. Um, I hope that we will continue these discussions uh, outside for uh, where we have uh, reception uh, refreshments uh, set out for you. Um, and uh, I mentioned the challenges of the second part of the trilogy. Absolutely. I think you've made the transition effectively. <laughs> Obviously, you can't miss tomorrow's third Reichshaar no. lecture, uh, four o'clock in this room. Please join me in thanking our speaker and the discussion. Thank you.